Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you all for joining us today, and welcome to the Inter-American Dialogue. Uh, this morning, we have a very special session focused on the state of Cuba's economy, which by all accounts is getting worse. There have been uh, a lack of government reforms, reduced financial support from Venezuela, and also punitive measures from the U.S. administration. As a result, we see new hardships for the island's population, growing shortages of food, medicine, and other basic goods, increasingly difficult environment for the emerging private sector, and emigration pressures are also rising. I'm very, very happy this morning to welcome Carmelo Mesalago. It's great to have you with us. We've been working on this event for a long time, and uh, I want to thank you for joining us. Uh, President uh, uh, Professor Mar uh, Mesalago is um, a distinguished service uh, emeritus, uh, uh, Professor Emeritus of Economics and Latin American Studies, University of Pittsburgh. Uh, he's widely recognized as the most credible and respected scholar working on the Cuban economy today. He has been remarkably prolific in his career. He's written only 82 books, 275 articles, which have been published in seven languages in 34 countries. So, and I'm sure there's a lot, lot more to come. Um, he's been honored with many, many awards, prizes, and distinctions. I hope he'll forgive me if I don't mention, mention all of them in this introduction. Uh, I had the pleasure of, uh, of seeing Professor uh, Mesalago at the, um, the University of Pittsburgh last year. And uh, I gave a talk, and he asked me a very tough question. So this is my chance to get back uh, at him and uh, ask a tough question. So thank you very much, Professor Mas uh, Mesalago, for joining us. Uh, we're also very pleased to have with us Vicki Huddleston, who's a retired US diplomat after a very successful and distinguished career in the Foreign Service. She's held a number of high-level positions and was in charge of the then U.S. intersection in Havana from 1999 to 2002. And earlier, she was deputy and then coordinator in the Office of Cuban Affairs. And she follows Cuba and U.S. policy with uh, very keen interest. So welcome, Ambassador. Thank you very much for being with us. Um, the session will be moderated by Peter Hakem, who is chiefly responsible and deserves all the credit for organizing this event. He's been following Cuba closely for many years, at least since he's been married. Uh, his wife is Cuban, so uh, uh, that sort of focuses your attention. He's traveled to Cuba many times and often comments about the situation there and U.S. policy towards the island. He uh, is a senior fellow and president emeritus here at the Dialogue. Uh, before turning it over to uh, Peter, I just want to thank and recognize uh, Irene and Elizabeth and Sophia uh, for their assistance and support with this event. So again, thank you all for being with us today, and I look forward to what I'm sure will be a very stimulating discussion. Thank you. Uh, it's my turn. Uh, thank you, Michael, for a, a great introduction, uh, setting the stage for this. And uh, I do want to just add one thing to Carmelo's biography is that he mentioned that he was sort of uh, one of the most respected writers on the Cuban economy on Cuba. But I want to say he's not only focused on Cuba. He is a very wide ranging uh, sets of interests and as the number of books written is uh, uh, is, is indicative of that. He's probably written more books than I've read. <laughs> and uh, uh, Vicky uh, Huddleston has also written two recent books on on, on Cuba. Uh, the latest well, one's recent. The other one's well, it depends old. what you mean by recent. I mean within the, within the decade. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, both of them on her experiences in Cuba as uh, as the what is it, what do they call it the I was the principal officer principal officer for Cuba. Uh, and even let's start out with uh, Carmelo Mesa Lagos, who has been looking at the Cuban economy recently with a very strong microscope and can give us a, a good sense of where we are and. Uh, 
Then we'll turn to Vicky and sort of look at a little bit of the political ramifications of this yes. for Cuba and the U.S. Yes. Well, uh, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. And my appreciation to both Michael and Peter that have been so persistent. Uh, I was supposed to be here last year, but uh, there was a sudden illness. So I am recovered. I am happy to be here. And the presentation is going to focus on the impact uh, on the Cuban economy of two important factors. First, the economic crisis in Venezuela, and second, uh, Trump policies in Cuba. If you ask me uh, what has been the constant in 60 years of prices of Cuban goods, such as sugar and nickel, that were paid well above the, the world market price, as well as the oil that the Soviet Union was selling to Cuba below the market price. Cuba only paid back 0.5% of the total. And the, and the whole amount was condoned, well, except for the original capital that was relatively small, by Russia a couple of years ago. So when the Soviet Union collapsed, then you have the, the worst crisis in Cuba after the Great Depression, which is euphemistically called by, by Cuba the special period in time of peace. In the case of Venezuela, I am going to show you that at the peak of the economic relationship, the whole relationship was tantamount to 22% of Cuban GDP. Surprisingly, despite this phenomenal support, Cuba has been unable to finance its imports, which is on exports, without success from another uh, country. And the economic performance has been dismal, as you can see here. Uh, that's the GDP, the uh, gross domestic product growth between the year that uh, Raul took over, it was August 2006, until uh, the year 2018. And in the last three years, the average GDP growth has been 1.1%. Uh, the goal for this year is 1.5%. And most Cuban economists, both in, in Cuba and outside of Cuba, agree that this is not going to be met. So we are talking about stagnation or is the possibility of a decline in, in GDP. And this is not the only indicator. So here you have two uh, other ones. The first uh, is the blue curve. It's a gross uh, domestic capital formation. Now this is quite important. Because the higher this is, better your chances of economic growth. And as you can see, there is a peak of about 15% in 2008, and then goes down. In the last seven years, it has averaged 9% of GDP. So that you, uh, to, put, to place this in perspective, in 1989, before the crisis, it was 25%. And this is precisely the, the figure that the Cuban government considers it is essential for economic growth, the sustainable economic growth in Cuba. And the second uh, indicator in orange is a fiscal deficit. As you can see, it declined. And then it increased to 8.7% in 2018. And the figure for, uh, excuse me, 17, which is the la latest figure a statistic that we have uh, from Cuba, and uh, the year, the last year, it was 11 percent, which is the highest uh, deficit since the the crisis of the 1990s. Uh, there are other uh, indicators. For instance, the index of uh, industrial output, 
in 2017 was one third of what it was in 1989. The sugar harvest this year is less than one third what it was in 2000 in, in 1989. Mining production has been declining in the last five years. Agricultural fishing. Uh, production is also down. So you have, despite of this phenomenal aid uh, from Venezuela since 2000, the year 2000, there is a dismal economic performance in Cuba. So here, uh, by the way, this is mostly based on a paper that I wrote with uh, Pavel Vidal Alejandro, which is a Cuban economist. I think uh, it has been distributed, I assume. Right. So you have it, and there's a lot of detail there. Uh, but I, I try to simplify, to present one, in one figure, basically most of the uh, factors of the economic relationship between Cuba and, and Venezuela. At the, at the top of it, uh, the blue curve, that's the total of the relationship, adding everything else. As you can see, it increases from about $7 billion to a peak of $16, say $16 billion in 2012, and it declines to 8. That is a decline of 50% since the peak. And uh, the composition of this total, the first one and the most important source of uh, hard currency in Cuba, is the selling of professional services, physicians, nurses, teachers, etc. And Venezuela buys, or used to buy, 75% of that. And as you can see, it increased from 4 billion to a peak of almost 8 billion in 2013, and then declined to 5.8 billion in 2017. That's a decrease of 24%. The second component is the supply of fuels, Venezuela to Cuba. And again, you have a peak of six billion, and it goes, it goes down to 1.8 billion. That's a decline of 70%. Uh, at the peak of the relationship, Cuba was receiving daily 105,000 barrels of oil. The latest figure that we have for June of this year is 40,000. So you can see it's a phenomenal decrease. And that I have affected everything because there is a scarcity of consumer goods in Cuba in part because uh, inputs into agriculture uh, have, have suffered from the lack of, 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 of uh, production. Uh, Cuba was able to increase oil production until the year 2014. After that, there has been a decline in domestic production in Cuba. So you have an energetic crisis or deficit because of a cut from Venezuela, but also a decline in domestic production of oil. And the, and the final one is merchandise trade, excluding oil, and that increased from 155,000 to 2.5 billion, and it's 376,000. So this uh, gives you a picture of the impact uh, or the Venezuelan crisis on Cuba, and to put it more simple, uh -oh. uh, this is the percentage of Venezuelan total aid, as described in the previous figure, in relation to GDP. As you can see, it rises to almost 22% in, in 2012 and declines to 8% of GDP. That's a, it's a reduction of 14 percentage points. Now, what happens if the Venezuelan regime collapses? Uh, we have projected that there will be another decline of eight percentage points. That will be $8 billion. Uh, there will be a decline in investment of 20%. Oh, I forgot to tell you also that in the period from 2000 to 2017, Venezuela have direct investment in Cuba for $8 billion, including the refinery, the oil refinery in Cienfuegos, which was crucial because Venezuela was supplying the crude 
Cuba was refining the, the crude oil, returning the refine to Venezuela, but there was a surplus that Venezuela allowed Cuba to keep. The same thing that happened with the Soviet Union in those 30 years of the relationship. And Cuba sold that oil, refined oil, in the world market. And of course, it, have, it was an important source of hard coal. So that also is basically gone. Uh, so there is going to be a crisis in Cuba. One important question is, is this going to be a repetition of the crisis of the 1990s? Our evaluation is it will be a very severe crisis, but not as bad as that one. And there are several reasons for that. The, the first one is that Cuba has more diversified trade partners and investment. For instance, the relationship with the Soviet Union at a peak was 80% two percent of total trade volume of Cuba. With Venezuela, the peak was 44. Now it's about 17. So there is much more trade partners than before, and there is also more foreign investment in Cuba than uh, in, the 19, in, 19, in the 1990s. The second is tourism. Uh, there was very little tourism in Cuba. Now uh, tourism is the third source of hard currency, and we're talking about close to three and a half uh, billion dollars because of that. And then you have also foreign remittances. There were no foreign remittances in before, and now we are the second source of our currency is about $3.6 billion. And there was less dependency on imported oils. At the time of the Soviet Union, it was 98% of the oil was received from the Soviet Union because of the increase of oil production in Cuba is only half now. And globally, the economic relationship with the Soviet Union at the peak was 28% of Cuban GDP, and with Venezuela, uh, is about 8 after the decline. It used to be 22%. In top of that, you have also uh, Trump measures against Venezuela and Cuba. I, I don't have time to to enumerate this, but we can discuss that later. I think the two most important ones are uh, the implementation of Title VI of the helms burton Law, which is embargo or blockade, depending on where you're talking of the USA or Cuba. And that is going to have an impact in terms of freezing foreign investment. Uh, the, the paper documents how much the claims are already and what will happen when this uh, Title VI is fully implemented for those uh, claims that are not documented yet. We're talking about maybe 200,000 and hundreds of millions billions of, of dollars. And the second one is tourism. And within tourism, the key is the banning of cruises. Because what happened in Cuba in the last three years is that there was a phenomenal increase in tourists going by cruises. Uh, it's much more now than tourists going by, 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 by air. And that means that this is going to have a severe impact, not in, in European or Canadians, but on, on Americans. And those were the, it was a group that was growing faster uh, in the last years after, after Obama uh, opened up uh, and started the normalization process, it then uh, reversed. <coughs> In my opinion, remittances, uh, the government have placed a cap of $4,000 per year. That it will be very difficult to implement uh, because it's per person, but there are several people who could be sending the money. So. And that happened under the George W. Bush administration, which, by the way, the, the cap was lower than under Trump. That was impossible to, to implement. The same thing that you cannot send remittances to members of the army or members of the, uh, the, of the, of the party. How, how can you identify this? Somebody else can receive it and then give it to, to the other. Alternatives. In my opinion, the only alternative that Cuba has is to accelerate 
and deepen the structural economic reforms that began to be implemented on the Raul in the, in the decade between 2007 and 2017. Those reforms were well oriented towards the market, but unfortunately, they were obstructed by a lot of restrictions, very high taxes, changes in the policy, actually at one point stagnation, and also they were very, very slow. So these have to be accelerated and deepened. And, and the model for that, and I am not saying that Cuba should copy that 100%, it has to be adapted to pe peculiarities of Cuba, but it's to follow the success of policies, economic policies, of China and Vietnam. These are two countries that have the highest uh, growth rates in the world, despite some slowdown, a recent slowdown. And also, they became self-sufficient in terms of food. Uh, actually, Vietnam is an exported, a net exported of food. It's providing Cuba with 250,000 tons of rice that Cuba, by the way, could produce domestically. And, and Cuba could do the same, if it, starting with the implementation of an agrarian reform that could follow the basic tenets of those uh, Asian, uh, Asian countries. One final thing. There is no replacement for Venezuela. We go in the papers through that. The two candidates, best candidates are the Russia and China, and we gave the reasons why this is not feasible. Uh, to start with, Cuba cannot sell medical services to this to the country because the physician will have to learn Russian or Chinese. <laughs> but not only not only not only that, I have calculated that. Venezuela have paid Cuban doctors, not that really Cuban doctors, but the Cuban government, because only a fraction is paid to, to the doctors themselves, 27 times what an average Venezuelan doctor earns. And this is the hidden subsidy in the same way that was explicit in the case of the Soviet Union. They were paying the price of sugar seven or 11 times the price of the world market, nickel 50% above the price the world market price and petroleum order the world. Here is physicians. And none of these two countries is willing to do that because it will be a huge amount of money. It is ironic that during the worst point of the crisis of the 1990s, it was Fidel Castro, reluctantly, that introduced modest economic reforms. For instance, tourism, opening for remittances, allowing the dollar to circulate, opening free agricultural markets, and so on, expanding self-employment. And I think the, the Cuban leadership could learn from the commander-in-chief what they did in that moment of crisis, which now uh, is uh, approaching again in Cuba. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sort of a grim picture you're putting out. Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll get to uh, interrogating you on that uh, soon after Vicky tells us what policy. It's a presidential policy because presidents have shamefully <laughs> used it to their advantage, beginning with one of my favorites, President Kennedy. Kennedy, knowing that the Nixon-Eisenhower administration had planned an invasion, he had been briefed, claimed when he was in competition with Nixon that the Eisenhower-Nixon administration was weak on communism. So he was using it as a cudgel. He was elected. And I think we know the rest. He didn't want to do Day of Pigs. He did Bay of Pigs. Uh, it was a failure. He didn't follow up with overwhelming U.S. support. And since that date, most Cuban Americans until, uh, let's say, the 2000s, late 90s, voted Republican. Uh, 
in retaliation for Kennedy. So let's jump ahead to another Democratic president. And this Democratic president is Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton, out of money, in trouble on several sexual scandals, went to Jorge Mascanosa, president of the Cuban American National Foundation, and said, let's make a deal. I will support this uh, Cuba Democracy Act that tightened the embargo by forbidding U.S. subsidiaries in third countries from doing business in Cuba if you'll tell the Cuban Americans they can vote for me. Jorge Mas Canosa said, that's a deal. And about two days later, I got on my desk uh, the Cuba Democracy Act with a note from President George H.W. Bush that said, what the hell's going on? And I can imagine he would say that because his brother Jeb was in Miami, close to the Cuban-American community. They always supported him, and suddenly now they seemingly had turned against him. And that was simply because they wanted this Cuba Democracy Act passed. And why did they want it passed? Although Cuba had withdrawn 50,000 troops from Africa, and the United States, the Republican administration of Reagan and Bush had been instrumental in this agreement. Uh, and there had been some promises, perhaps, behind the scene. The United States would look favorably, maybe not increase the embargo for Cuba's compliance with this agreement and getting out of Africa. Because at the time, that was what was the most important thing for us. So H.W. Bush, who was a good foreign policy president, uh, didn't really want to do this. But when Clinton undercut him by endorsing the Cuba Democracy Act, he signed on and he signed it into law. Presidential policy became embodied in law when the Cuban Cubans shot down two planes, the brothers to the rescue, and the retaliation was the Cuba Liberty Act, or the, the one we're dealing with now, uh, with Title III uh, going into effect, allowing Cubans, Americans, and Americans to sue. So, so cu the Cuba Democracy Act codified the embargo. It just took the whole thing and put it in law. But within the law, of course, it said, this law can be changed by the Secretary of Treasury, et cetera, et cetera. So what the Cuban Americans hoped is that by passing this law, it would prevent Clinton or any other president from changing the embargo. Because what do you need with an embargo uh, when you don't have an enemy anymore off your shores? You don't have missiles pointed at you. You don't have the Soviet Union there. So maybe we would change and try a different way. So we'll put it all in law. But by putting it in law, it meant that only the president could modify it. And that's what we've now seen. And before, just in case you have any doubt, because Clinton sent back little Ellie and Gonzalez floating you know, in the inner tube in the Florida Straits, Al Gore lost the election. Al Gore needed 500 more votes to, to, to take Florida. And the Cuban Americans, for sending back little Elian, had the uh, voto castigo. <laughs> and he got 18% of the Cuban American vote, whereas Clinton had gotten about 30%. So what happens? Uh, George W. Bush, after initially allowing the Clinton opening to continue is, uh, I wouldn't say forced, but is encouraged by Jeb Bush, who's uh, running for a second term as governor, uh, and by a speech he gives in uh, uh, Miami on the occasion of the 100th anniversary of uh, Cuban independence to tighten the policy. So he tightens the policy, you know, rolling back the, the Clinton openings that were uh, essentially uh, on, on travel and exchanges. And then we have finally a president uh, 
who says, okay, let's get rid of this, let's open up with Cuba, let's, this is a failed policy, let's see if it works. Obama does that, and guess what happens? Why should we be surprised? Because Clinton did exactly the same thing as candidate Trump. Trump had actually sent his people to, to Cuba when he was a businessman looking into the possibilities of a hotel, maybe a Trump Havana. <laughs> uh, he decides, lobbied by the Cuban American Republicans, and most of the Cuban American Republicans are very conservative, want to go back to the old times. Okay, let's get rid of the Obama stuff. So Trump eventually campaigns on that. He fulfills his campaign, and Everything's back to square run. Obama's reversed, but not reversed completely. And then we get uh, National Security Advisor Bolton, who always has had a vendetta about uh, against Cuba. In fact, Bolton lied about Cuba having weapons of mass destruction in order to push George W. Bush toward a harder line and to undermine uh, Jimmy Carter's uh, trip to Cuba in 2002. So, yes, it's a presidential policy built on a family feud, which number three leads us to the fact that it's a corrupt policy. It's an ineffective policy. There's been no change. <laughs> and it's a policy that's detrimental, as we've heard from Carmelo, to, to Cuba. Cuba is its own worst enemy, but the United States only adds to the, uh, to the disaster uh, for the Cuban people. It's a disaster for the region because if Cuba were an active part of the region with its culture, its education, its health care, the region would be more likely to prosper. And it's a disaster for the United States because we're pushing Cuba into the arms of Russia and China. So quickly, I'll wind up and say, this is what we need to do. First of all, we should be planning every way we can of uh, pressing the next Congress of the United States to completely lift the embargo to treat Cuba as a normal country. Uh, when the president, hopefully a new one comes in, uh, that president should immediately return to the Obama reforms because Obama went about as far as the executive can go. So the next step then is the Congress. Third, we should do everything with the region because we have no credibility on Cuba after 60 years. Fourth, I've heard people talk about a Marshall Plan. Yes, we should have a Marshall Plan for Central America, for Cuba, uh, for the Caribbean. We should include Mexico, Canada, any other countries that want to be part of this so that we lift this region up. After all, our security depends on our neighbors. And as we've seen with illegal and immigration, uh, we, if this country, if these countries can prosper, then we're not going to have such a great problem with immigration. And finally, this means that part of that lifting the region up uh, is that we should do an oil facility. If little old Aunt Venezuela can do an oil facility for the region, why can't we? Because that's part of the current problem. So let me just end with, with the story. It's a brief story, but about when I was leaving Cuba, about three months before I was leaving, I was driving the official car down Quinta Avenida into, into town, and I saw uh, along the curbside uh, some young people, probably, you know, uh, high school age, and I said, well, get in. They were looking for a ride. They jumped in the car. I think we had maybe six of them I had in the car. And all of a sudden they're like, what? You know, this is, this is this big car, and in Cuba it's either old cars or these little Lottas. So a young lady says, what kind of car is this? 
I said, oh, well, it's a, a Ford Crown Victoria. And it was armored, too, so it was a big black car. And she said, who are you? And I said, well, I'm a head of the American diplomatic mission, the United States intersection. And I, there was silence. <laughs> I said, uh oh, <laughs> uh, they're going to ask me to stop and let him out of the car. <laughs> but then someone pipes up and says, be our mother, take us to Miami. <laughs> And I've always thought, no, no, the future has got to be in Havana. And repeatedly, with the good help of the Cuban government's economic policies, we've m made it so there's no future in Cuba for its young people. Thank you. Thank you, Vicky. <laughs> terrific. Uh, I know there's a lot of people out here who have a lot of questions. Uh, uh, I'm going to ask a few questions to begin with just to sort of warm them up so they can answer the more difficult questions that are going to come from the audience. Uh, Carmelo, can I start with you? Uh, your picture of the Cuban economy is, is pretty dire, pretty, pretty difficult. and. Uh, uh, particularly looking at the collapse of Venezuela and the uh, uh, punitive measures of the United States. Is there really anything that's going to allow Cuba to move forward now? You talk about economic reforms, but with you know, the collapse of any kind of investment income in Cuba, with the difficulties now of opening any trade uh, uh, contracts and any, any trade with countries throughout the world because of U.S. restrictions and limited investment from overseas, is, you know, does it really make any sense even to talk about economic reforms at this point in Cuba? Yes, I think it's essential. The major problem of the Cuban economy is the system itself. It's a highly centralized planning system, the so-called command economy, that has failed everywhere. Because what we have in China and Vietnam is not a centrally planned economy. They have a, a decentralized economy. It's like a guidance plan. And of course, where the private sector and the market play a substantial role. That's not what you have in Cuba. So you have to start from inside, and you don't need to, well, it will help a lot, of course, the external sector, but let's take agriculture. As, as um, Michael mentioned, there is a very severe scarcity of food and consumer goods in Cuba, everything. And actually, uh, the government was pressured to put that back in the rationing list. Uh, one of the goals of uh, Raul Castro reforms was to get rid of rationing, the, the libreta. And, and there was an advance of that because def different items gradually were taken out of, of the rationing system and sold in free market at the price of supply and demand. But they have to put those back because there was hoarding. And they say, well, we have to, we have to assure that everybody will have an equal ration. So the Agricultural uh, production has been a disaster. And Raul Castro major ag agrarian reform was a so-called usufructo, which is idle state land is given to farmers uh, and on the contract. They don't, they don't give away the property. You, you can work the land, appropriate the fruit. That's what usufructo is. A 10-year contract that then were extended to 20. But you have to sell to the government part of the crop, in some cases the majority of the crop, at a price set by the government below supply and demand. So that is a phenomenal disincentive for production. So let's take what China and Vietnam did in agriculture. First of all, the farmer is free to produce whatever they want. 
Second, they are also free, and this is quite important, to sell it to whoever they want it. They don't have to sell it to the state. So they sell it at supply and demand prices. So they are making much more money. And third, the contracts are either for 50 years, not 20, or for an indefinite period of time. And that gives assurance to the farmer for investment in the land. The first usufruit land law in Cuba uh, banned investment, which was absolutely ridiculous. Why you should do that? I mean, allow, you, you have to incentivate the incentive in the land so that you can produce more. The second, there have been three laws. The second one allow investment, but only in 1% of the parcel. So why you should limit this? And then the third one, because they were flexibilizing more and more as the previous law didn't work, is to say, okay, 3%. So if Cuba were to follow, and of course in China and Vietnam there is no limitation, you, want, you invest as much as you want. If Cuba were to follow this type of policy with the proper adaptations, in six years it will be able to be self-sufficient in food. You don't need anything external. You start with the most fundamental thing, which is agriculture. Well, <laughs> just seems hard, uh, frankly, for me, looking at you know sort of the numbers that you put out on the drop. Oh, by the way, all all these figures, uh, Peter, are from the Cuban Statistics Yearbook, Oficina Nacional de Estadística Información. These are not guesses or anything like that. These are figures from Cuba. Let me think of a re response, and I want to ask <laughs> Ricky a question. Uh, let me say, you, you talked about the policy of the U.S. government over the years as being ineffective, uh, a failure. I think you used those words repeatedly. <laughs> well, I, I, there was other things, but that it didn't work. I mean, sometimes corruption does work, as we know. Uh, <laughs> uh, and the question I have, what about the Obama policy? Precisely the, those that are in favor of the current policy, if you said, well, nothing happened during the Obama lifting of the sanctions or reducing sanctions, opening diplomatic engagement and all, and that this wasn't going anywhere, and that was a failure too. No. How do you respond to no, that? No. But let me, uh, is this, let me, is that all right? Okay, let me give you two <laughs> examples, and one is not Obama, uh, one is uh, George W. Bush. So when George W. Bush first came in, uh, he nominated an assistant secretary who wasn't approved, which meant there was about a year and a half with only an acting assistant secretary. And for all of you aspiring uh, State Department officers, uh, when there's no political appointee in the chair, the Foreign Service officers who are acting cannot make major policy changes. So during this time, the Clinton opening, the travel, uh, allowed Cuba to gain some momentum to the extent that Cuba acquiesced in our putting the unlawful combatants at Guantanamo. They, Fidel just said, well, the Americans will do what the Americans want to do. That could have been a disaster for us publicly. Uh, trade was high in agricultural goods and a lot of uh, tourists were coming, but more importantly, Cuban human rights were the best they had ever been since Castro took power. This was the time of Osvaldo Paya. I know uh, a Washington uh, Post reporter is doing a story on Osvaldo Paya. Uh, this was the time of Project Varela in which uh, over 11,000 Cubans asked for uh, a change in the Cuban Constitution, a referendum, signed a petition. That all ended in 2003, a year later, when Bush clamped down at the behest of the Cuban-American community. So when Cuba is under threat, 
it clamps down not only on the economy, and I would say some of what we're seeing now on what's happening in the Cuban economy is a direct result of the Trump policy. So this happened under George W. Bush. Cuba was opening up. The United States got tough, and Cuba cracked down on the human rights activists, throwing 75 in jail. During Obama, most of the human rights activists were released from jail. Even today, the human, those in jail over time, long time sentences, that's not the norm. What Cuba does is they uh, put people in jail for two days a week to discourage them from activities they don't want them to carry out. But there's considerably more freedom in Cuban human rights than there has been uh, previously, even now as they're beginning to crack down again, particularly on artists. But we still have a very open internet. So what the Obama policy began to do was give Cubans some opportunity uh, to have small businesses. I remember going to Trinidad and seeing all these kids very proudly in their uniforms for being waiters. They had jobs. They had possibilities. They had a little bit of income. They could travel freely, particularly to Miami, which is where all Cubans like to go, right? <laughs> so things were basically improving considerably in the economy to some extent, but in the personal lives of Cubans and on the human rights side as well, and to a certain extent, also on political freedoms. You know, let's face it, I'm not an advocate for the Cuban government. It's a dictatorship, it's an authoritarian government with lack of freedom of speech, assembly, et cetera, et cetera. But even those things were beginning to open up a little bit, and those are what gave Raul Castro the possibility of doing some of those reforms that Carmelo spoke of. So yes, I think had the Obama, I know, had the Obama, uh, uh, opening continued, we would have begun to see a very different Cuba than we see today. Um, I disagree with you on the point uh, that the Cuban economy was doing well before Trump measures. Because what I show there in the first uh, figure, you can see that in 2012, is a peak of the economic relationship right. and then began to decline. Uh, Trump didn't take over until 17. So there was a significant deterioration of the Cuban economy, not only because of the crisis in Venezuela, but because the Raul Castro reform didn't have a significant impact in the economy because they, they were a lot of problems. I have documented that in my latest book. So uh, the, 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 the deterioration began before before Trump, of course. Uh, and I think the major factor is the Venezuelan crisis. Of course, to that you have to, it's compounded by the Trump uh, policies, but it, it's something that has to do with the crisis in Venezuela and the economic system itself. The Raul Castro reforms were actually stagnated at the time of the normalization process with Obama. Recall this, Obama met with micro entrepreneurs in Cuba. The day after he left Cuba, Fidel Castro was still alive, and he sent a message, what he called a reflection, published in all the newspapers, the brother Obama. And what he was saying was that Obama was pursuing the imperialist dream of destroying Cuba with a different uh, strategy, which was to expand the private sector. And it was like a Trojan horse in Cuba. And the following day, all communications in Cuba, all media began to criticize Obama. So, you know, it takes two to tango, basically. Let, let me answer that because, you know, your facts are your facts. But he, here's the thing. Raul Castro was beginning the economic reforms as 
the fall off in Venezuelan oil. So it's almost impossible to know, you know, how much uh, the oil crisis led to uh, the reforms not having an economic uh, impact. I mean, they may have, those reforms of Raul Castro actually ha kept the 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 bottom from falling out as fast as it, as it did but i think the bigger bigger point for me is that it seemed to me that raul castro was trying to carry forward the modest reforms and fidel castro was not and so that fidel castro was not trying to make the reforms has in a way no bearing whatsoever because he died the next year so we're all could have could have gone ahead then. Well, let's open it up. I mean, there's an yeah. interesting yeah, yeah. debate whether Raul would or actually wouldn't. promoted the reforms or was part of the group blocking the reform. Uh, uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> let's open it up for questions. I see Bill Good. Bill, he. <laughs> I always get them wrong. Sorry, Bill. Question for Carmelo. Are we on? There we go. Uh, clearly, in the medium to long term, the only solution here is for state enterprises to become more efficient. And you know, the Cuban government, as you know well, has had a business improvement plan in place at least since the lineamientos were put in place, you know, way back in 2011. Um, so can you give us an update on how that business improvement plan has been going? Uh, has it had any impact? If it hasn't really had much impact, what are the obstacles that are keeping it from being successful? Okay, Bill. This is an old issue, actually, because you are talking about the, the guidelines of the party in 2011. So it's, this is eight years after that. And there have been, before that, actually, uh, with Fidel, there was an attempt to do that reform, uh, you know, to improve the performance of the state enterprise. That was way be before 2011. And really, nothing has happened. Nothing has happened far. Uh, because there is this continuous idea that the economic problem could be solved by improving the plan, that for, for instance, the plan to 2030, and by improving the performance of state enterprises. And they are going around what is the major way to do it, which is to decentralize through the expansion of the non-state sector. And they have been an improvement in that, but not enough. Not enough. We are talking about maybe 31 percent, and out of that 31 percent, you also add Cooperatives are included there, and cooperatives, you know, <laughs> are a disaster. Cooperatives have been declining in number and membership. Mm -hmm. uh, agricultural uh, cooperatives have very bad performance. You can see that in the figures uh, of the statistical year book in which they disaggregate pro production by cooperative, production by the private sector, etc. The private sector. It's tiny, but it is much more effective, and it supplies most of the consumer goods that the population needs. So that, that is not going to solve the problem. That is uh, going around what should be the central goal of the government. Young lady. So I have a, a question for Professor Carmelo, um, and it's uh, you talk about uh, in terms of numbers about uh, Venezuelan financial support. Uh, I was wondering if you have also some numbers of some kind of metrics of the negative impacts that the uh, Trump administration measure has had in the Cuban economy as a general, and also in the private sector in particular. 
Excuse me, I want to be sure of your question. You are talking about what is the economic importance of the private sector? Impact, today? impact. If you have numbers of yes. the negative consequences, I mean, okay. and some of those uh, measures, as you said, are very recent. So maybe that be that's why we don't have many numbers. But if you have a sense of uh, of the impact in terms of cruise ships and tourism and uh, and on the private sector, meaning that uh, like a private owner, a, a person that heads the the a restaurant, a paladar in Cuba, for instance. We're not talking only about that person, right? We're talking about the whole family and the community that, for instance, receives like, money from them. So in more like general uh, terms. OK. We don't have, by the way, I answered your question, sorry for this advertisement, in my latest book, which I was going to present here next year. <laughs> Good enough. So buy the book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now have three uh, books. Voices of change in Cuba. <laughs> I try to compile all the data available in terms of the impact of the private sector in the Cuban economy. I have not seen yet a figure of how much of GDP is generated by the private sector in Cuba. Remember that the private sector is a fraction of the non-state sector because you have the cooperative there. And that's bigger probably than the private sector itself. We're talking about self-employment use for farmers, uh, a little bit the, the cooperative, uh, non-agricultural and, and service cooperative. When you are talking about tourism, tourism generates, uh, is a third source of hard currency in Cuba. I, I said it already. It's about $3.5 billion. And within tourism, the private sector is, or was, playing an increasing important role because the two most profitable self-employment occupations in Cuba are renting homes or rooms, back and breakfast. And the second one are private small restaurants called Paladares in Cuba. They provide much better service than hotels, and Paladares in terms of food and service are, are much better than the state. I was in Cuba last time in January of 2017. I went with all my family, grandchildren, etc. We rented a mansion in Miramar that has seven bedrooms and five bathrooms. Mm -hmm. And we pay 40% of what we have paid if we have been not to the best hotel, but a middle rank hotel. The problem with this, and by the way, systematically, we ate in government restaurants and in private restaurants, and the difference was abysmal. In New Year Eve, we went to a restaurant that used to be private and had been, become public only two months before. There were five courses, I swear, we couldn't eat one of them. We couldn't. Like they were not reason. edible. <laughs> I don't want to describe you the food. In in the Paladares, there were, were different qualities, but the food was very good and the service was good because they have the incentive to provide better treatment of the customers. So this is very important, but the government, one of the things that Raul did at the end, I was to suspend licenses for renting houses and and don't give any more license for restaurants, private restaurants. So th this is the issue again. This is the issue. So the the measures that are being enacted now in terms of restricting remittances to four thousand dollars, if they are effective, they are going to harm the private sector in Cuba, particularly those two which are extremely successful. But it's not only from the American side, it's also from the Cuban side in terms of restrictions, inspections, shutting down restaurants because they are not hygienic conditions or because they are selling some food that are banned. This gentleman here, tell us Thank who you are. Thank you very much. Uh, James Innes, I'm from the Paris Center at the National Defense University. 
Vicky, I really enjoyed what you had to say, and I have a couple of questions about what you said towards the end about things should change with a new administration. It would appear to me that the Democrat candidates so far, not a lot of them have talked about foreign policy. They seem more focused on domestic policy. The current president seems very focused on China, Iran, insulting the British ambassador. Um, and it just seems to me that US foreign policy has a lack of emphasis in the Caribbean. And even when there is an emphasis, it's more on China. Do you really believe that a new administration or whatever happens in 2020, that they really have the, the bandwidth and the interest to change things like President Obama did in 2015? Thank you. Well, I don't really know what this administration's foreign policy is. <laughs> yes, I can say that because I come from out of town. Uh, it, it, it says America first. It says we're going to retrench, and then you know we're picking uh, conflicts with Venezuela, with Iran, with Nicaragua, and uh, and with uh, and with and with Cuba. So I think a democratic administration would certainly not be looking to pick those kinds of fights. Uh, some of the candidates have indicated that they would. Some of the democratic candidates change policy on Cuba. One of the things that concerns me about the Democratic candidates, which is kind of true for U.S. foreign policy uh, since Clinton, uh, and we haven't had a foreign policy president. A president really understands and cares about foreign policy because we're always talking about domestic policies to get the votes. So what happens is that because Cuba isn't exactly important, it's not up there with Iran or North Korea or anybody else, probably even it, with Venezuela, although Venezuela may be a stalking horse, as I think Peter mentioned, uh, for Cuba, uh, it gets pushed down. Okay, we won't say anything about it because we don't want to annoy an important domestic constituency. But I can't imagine any Democratic president not at least going back to the Obama opening. It's going to be harder to get uh, the laws for at least, maybe more, that govern the embargo lifted. Uh, it will probably be done incrementally. But what, you know, what I think the Democrats have to do, I'm not making policy for them, unfortunately, is they have to do this regional approach to the Caribbean and Central America. And in so doing, they have to uh, include Cuba within it. Let me ask you a related question, if I can. You, uh, that is, year in and year out, for the past dozen years or so, I keep hearing that the Cuban population in Miami is becoming more <laughs> moderate yeah. and open and they're less concerned about... Oh, regions. I love that. And every time there's an election, we all say, well, the Republicans get the hard line and the Democrats get those opposed to the hard line and the Republicans come out ahead. Right. Now, so are things changing or aren't they changing uh, in the Cuban community in Miami? Actually, they've changed back to harder line, I believe. Why? I haven't looked at the recent poll because they follow the president. And so there was a slim majority of Cuban Americans that supported the Obama opening, but just a slim majority. And because the influential, rich, well-established Cuban Americans are Republicans, when President Trump uh, changed, they shifted back and then they said, oh, well, Obama's policy wasn't working anyway. The big mistake Obama made, and he made it for obviously political reasons, is that he did not uh, open up to Cuba in his first term. Because had he done it then, uh, then it would have been an established policy and Cuban Americans and Cubans, I believe, would have seen change. But I agree with Carmelo. Cuba is not a good government, politically or economically. By the way, what you are saying is supported by a biannual uh, survey, which is conducted by Florida International University in southern Florida. And then there was a trend, an increasing trend of support of Obama's policies, in general, opening to Cuba, in general. And then the last one, last year, there was a reversal. Not a big one, but there was a reversal. But it also depends on the age composition of the population. The older they are, 
more, more in favor of embargo. The younger they are, they are in favor of opening. So gradually, when the old people die, we keep opening. There will be more younger people, and there but will then be the young but then people we get, become old. Then, and, but then we get well, Marco <laughs> Rubio. But and, you are assuming that they will change. Yes, I think it has to do with the ideology of the older generations of Cuban Americans. I, I agree because if they're given the opportunity, they want to go back to regime change, and that's what we try. Younger people, no, younger people want to go back and forward to Cuba because they have relatives there. Yeah. So all the people that came in the last, I will say, 20 years, they are in favor of opening. It, when I went to Cuba in March, 90% of the people on the plane are Cuban Americans or Cuban, or Cuban residents. That's the that's the largest group of tourists going to Cuba after Canadians, Amer Cuban Americans. Vic, you were one of the first. It's really, on this precise point, you asked her basically the, the question that I was going to bring up, well, which is the fact that the we, except for Obama, we never really have had a Cuba policy. We've had a South Florida politics. And, um, and precisely because, as you mentioned, Cuba isn't that important in the broad scheme of American foreign policy, that's when domestic politics rule. Um, and the only president who, who broke away from that and had a Cuba policy was Obama. And he could do it precisely for the reason that he saw the evolution of the Cuban-American community. And he knew he could make this commitment to an opening with Cuba, and it would actually help him in Florida, which it did. But now that public opinion has gone back the other way, the question is, are we back to the situation where Florida politics is the Gordian knot here, that if you can't untie it, you can't make the kinds of changes you want to see? Uh, if I had to predict based on what I see going on now, there's going to be this flat-out competition between whoever the Democratic candidate is and Trump for the Florida vote, and it's going to be just extremely difficult for somebody on the Democratic side to come out and to, to indeed not make a deal like the previous deals you've talked about, uh, not to go forward on Cuba in order to try to get some some support from Florida. So, so you know, have we broken the Gordian knot yet, or not? And how, you know, how? And if not, how can we move forward on this issue? You know, well, I agree with everything you say, Vic. And you should know you were on the Hill during all of this working on Cuba. So, when is the United States going to have a moral foreign policy that's flexible, that's reliable? That's uh, that can be done. When you know, when are we going to stop catering to interest groups such as the Cuban American interest group that to our detriment? What what has it done? It's Cuba was beginning to open up, and now it's right back with uh, China and Russia because <laughs> Carmelo has indicated it can't sustain its people in that kind of position. So what's going to happen now? Well, every time these things really get tight in Cuba, what happens? Mass migration. Mass migration. And that, I think, is the most likely outcome we're looking at now. <laughs> Getting away from your point, but when Florida's going, so the, the Republicans and the Democrats cater to the Cuban-American community, and then we get a mass migration into Florida. Uh, more Cubans, and what will this administration do? Will this administration stop it by some sort of invasion as an excuse? And what happens then in Cuba? I mean, are we going to be, is, are Cubans or ourselves going to be any better off with regime change if there's chaos in Cuba and the economy tanks? I just think we have to have a better vision rather than catering to Cuban Americans, you know, after 60 years, enough. Let me ask a question that's a theoretical question. I know particularly uh, uh, that, that you're not a 
psychologist, a sociologist, or an economist. But, you know, Albert Hirschman was an economist, too, and he wrote a, uh, his best book, or his most uh, public, it's called Exit, Voice, and Loyalty. Right. Well, you're saying that the reaction of the Cuban people to the kind of economic situation, the kind of punishment the U.S. is applying, is going to be exit. Is there any chance for voice in Cuba, is the question. I think there, there was a time, and this is documented again in Voices of Change, uh, in which there was an opening in Cuba. And the opening was not only in terms of economics, which is the, you know, the private sector, self-employment, also fruit and all these things, but also there was opening spaces for discussion. And I will say that for me, the, the two most important channels for that were first a, a block uh, by two Cuban Americans that are still the, like the Cuban citizens that are in Cuba, and, and that was a passion like Cal. It was a, a journal and also monograph and a blog in which different points of view with respect to each other come up. They were closed by the Catholic Church. It was terrible, terrible. And then they opened something uh, which is called Cuba Possibly. And it lasted until one month ago uh, because the, the pressure of the government was such that they, there were European finances, finances that were stopped by the government not now by the Catholic Church. This was by the government. Uh, they they have a relationship with Spain for the uh, for like a registration that was canceled, and these people were forced to close this. And uh, you know they called themselves the loyal opposition, mm. and they were highly criticized by many Cuban Americans as being communists. So I think that those spaces. Are, are closing. They are not opening. They are closing. So you're saying no. So you're saying that. I'm saying no. That, but it's all up to the government. There's no spontaneous reaction. I mean. What, what is that again? Spontaneous. Not, you know, there's a lot of young people still in Cuba. Maybe they want to leave. Well, I think but that is there they any have protest an march? But the, the problem is, as Vicky says, what the, what the government, the U.S. government is going to do about that. By the way, Venezuelans are also living. The latest figure that I have is 4.5 million people. Right. And growing. People. And growing. And, and that, by the way, you know, are not going to have only uh, probably most of the Cuban American votes against Democrats, but you are going to have the Venezuelan exile. In my opinion, Trump policy is playing essentially to win Florida. Right. in the 2020 election. Right. Exactly. And um, I, by the way, he's a paper tiger because he has been saying once and again, there is another option, which of course is a military option, and Bolton have said it very clearly. Well, a lot of things has happened in Venezuela that would have prompted that, <laughs> that all, another option, and nothing has happened, and nothing is going to happen. Uh, the, the United States can defeat militarily the armed forces of Venezuela. But Venezuela is territory is twice that of Iraq. And occupying that country is, it will be a nightmare. And he's not going to go into that. I doubt that, that Trump will invade Cuba too. I mean, he knows more than that. Let's get some more. Qu Let me take three <laughs> questions, and because that's all we have time for. You've been very patient. Thank you. And very aggressive. <laughs> Hi, my name is. <laughs> My question is uh, regarding. You said that um, the native, the if there was a, an economic recession right now, will not be as hard as the one in 1994 or in the 90s. Uh, but the feeling, I was in Cuba in May. But the feeling there is that the crisis will be harder because, in terms of marginally speaking, they say that in the 90s they didn't have anything. Now they have something, and they and that will be taken away. So. My question is related to the social impact that us have. Um, now with technology, people have smartphones, and people are connected to social media. 
what's the possibility in your opinion that there will be some kind of social uprising due to the discontent of the economic recession? Yeah, well, I, 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 I do. Hello, come, let's take two other questions. Oh, okay, okay, okay. What is your name, please? You've been... What? Eduardo. Eduardo. Tell us who you are, too. I'm sorry I didn't ask who you are. <laughs> Manuel Gomez. I am a Cuban-American, and I'd love to stay on the politics because I think the trends of the last decade and decade and a half are real, and we are going to see them manifest more possibly in the 2020, but I'm going to go back to the economics, to Professor Mesalago. Um, the first one is, you didn't comment on the recent announcement of uh, um, uh, increases in salary for the, uh, not the state sector, for the, pri for the government sector. Um, and also their reiteration of more autonomy for state enterprises. I'm sorry, what was the second part? The, their, the reiteration in those See? public and reiteration, reiterado, reiterando, oh. of, of, um, of uh, autonomy for uh, state enterprises. And then you might, it might be interesting to hear your opinion about the role of remittances, because from what I understand, they end up being mostly um, sent out to bring in imports so that they flow out of the country. Last question, Luis. Thank you very much. Tell us who you are. Um, my name is Ricardo. I work here at the Dialogue in the Asia Latin America program. Um, the, during the talk, you've talked quite a bit about using China and Vietnam as models. And I think the comparison is pretty apt, um, except for that China and Vietnam both started their reforms and had sizable populations in the rural areas. So it was a rural reform moving towards the urban areas. In Cuba, the population is much more urbanized. Do you think this is an obstacle, or do you think um, that this is um, just something that can be easily overcome? Thank you. You want to start? Uh, okay. Uh, so, Eduardo, um, oh, right. I do agree with you. But there is no, and by the way, this is in the, in the paper that you have. Because I explained what are the reasons that will impede a, a repetition of the magnitude of the crisis of the 1990s. But I also have another area in which I am arguing what you are saying, but also something else. In, 19, in 1989, actually from 85 to 89, that was the best economic and social period, period under the revolution. The best, that was prior to the crisis. Now, there is a severe scarcity of consumer goods in Cuba. So, the economic situation today is worse than it was in 1989. Wow. And that means that the reaction of the population, <coughs> I, I don't want to predict about insurrections. That's not my feel. I, I don't have a crystal ball. But what I could say is that because there is a worse situation in Cuba now, and because there is all this communication, although I, I, I warn you the internet has expanded significantly, but one hour of internet costs $2.50, and the, after the increase of salaries, we are talking about $40 per month. So it, access is quite expensive for the average Cuban. Okay, but yes, you, you are right in what you are saying. And, and Manuel, the, there have been periodic increases in, in, in the state's medium salary. The difference of this one is that it's bigger than any of the previous one. We are talking about around 20 to 30 percent. However, when you measure, this is nominal salary, not adjusted for inflation. When you measure real salary, which is adjusting for inflation annually, and you compare that new salary now, with that in 1989, 
we had is about half of what the salary was before the crisis. That means that the persons in power of the workers in the state sector, the employees, even with the increase, is half of what it was. Now, you also mentioned uh, the confirmation or ratification of the importance of the private system. We have heard that before. We heard it on the Raul. But you, one thing is the rhetoric, and another thing are the facts. And when you look at the facts, it doesn't seem to me that there is a significant encouragement of the private sector. And I did a very careful study of the last legislature in April, the Asamblea Nacional del Poder Popular. They were talking essentially of continuity, continuismo, the central plan, the state enterprise, of course, more effective, but we have been, that, that was the answer that I gave to Bill. But there is, if there are four lines, and we are talking about pages and pages of, the, of grammar, of the, of the private sector, of the market, practically nothing. Uh, I quoted in the paper, I think a dozen Cuban economists, and they are pinpointing this problem. I mean, first of all, why don't you have a more dating policy in view of the crisis? Uh, number two, why are you ignoring a consensus among Cuban economists for a long time about the need for stronger economic reform? And, and, and what about the importance of the private sector? So that's rhetoric versus facts. Uh, Ricardo, yes, there is a difference. Uh, because, as you said, Cuba was urbanized even before the revolution. I mean, the, the majority of the population was urban. And, of course, that trend has continued uh, in all these 60 years. But the, the example that I gave about agriculture, uh, that doesn't, doesn't matter that you don't have as many people in, in agriculture. If you provide the monetary incentive for people to produce in agriculture, in the way that China and Vietnam did, you will have an increase in production. Vicky, you get the last word. It's going to have to be short. Oh, 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 that's too bad. But I just wanted <laughs> to pick up on what uh, Eduardo said. Uh, when uh, Secretary Carlos Gutierrez, who implemented uh, President Bush's policy when it was the most harsh, and then he changed his position. He's Cuban-American, obviously. And he went with Obama to Cuba. And he said the one thing that he was really, really struck by is so many Cubans said to him, we remember the special period in time of peace. We remember our desperation and the terrible times that, that we went through. So now, once again, we're going to help the Cuban people go through another period like that. That, to me, is an immoral policy. The Cuban people were full of hope. They are entrepreneurial. They're able to do great things. They're able to help the region. But instead, we make the divisions greater by refusing to promote reconciliation, which could have ended this a long time ago by ending uh, a good part of the embargo, and and now as they begin to suffer again, uh, lose their hope, the United States becomes irrelevant, the Cubans leave, we destroy the country, uh, and what what do we get for it? We're irre irrelevant to Cuba's future, uh, we have an enemy uh, 90 miles off our coast, and we lose the possibility of American investment or even of American moral and humanitarian leadership in the world by continuing to carry out a policy that we know is wrong, but do so because, as Vic made the, the, the case, for winning Florida. Well, this is a discussion that we will continue to have. I want to thank you, Carmelo, Vicky, for a really wonderful session. Thank all of you for the good questions. <laughs>